good evening from Wolfville and Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Welcome back to our virtual event series after a break in the month of May around our annual general meeting for the Alumni Association and our Alumni Awards celebration. It is very hot here today in Wolfville. We were over 30 degrees, and I suspect perhaps maybe even too hot to garden, if that's even possible. Uh, perhaps our guest speaker this evening will be able to shed some light on that. My name is Una Proudfoot, and I am the Executive Director of, the, of Alumni Affairs in the Office of Advancement at Acadia. And it's a pleasure to introduce our guest this evening, Melanie Priesnitz, who has kindly taken time out of her busy schedule and out of her garden to provide a brief introduction to the plant research and conservation work happening at the Casey Irving Environmental Science Center and Harriet Irving Botanical Gardens at Acadia, and to discuss how to garden with nature using native plants. Melanie will share some of her favorite native plants suitable for use in home gardens, as well as talk about why gardening for both people and the planet is so important. And now to our guest speaker, if I may take a moment to introduce Melanie. Ms. Priesnitz began her work at the Harriet Irving Botanical Gardens during the construction and planting phase in the year 2000. She got involved with the project through her Nova Scotia Community College work term while attending the Horticultural and Landscape Technology Program and has never looked back. She was thrilled to be hired by Acadia as the first employee of the Botanical Gardens in 2002 and now manages the six acre garden. Melanie has furthered her education part time and holds certificates in applied plant conservation and organic soil science. Working at the Casey Irving Environmental Science Center and the Harriet Irving Botanical Gardens has been a dream come true for Melanie because the center is the perfect meeting ground for her strongest passions, plants, people, and the environment. So a very warm, or should I say hot, welcome to you, Melanie, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Over to you. Thank you, Una. Thanks very much. And welcome, everyone. It's uh, nice to know that you're out there um, all across uh, maybe the Acadian Forest region and maybe much further afield. Um, I wish you could all be with us here at Acadia today and in the gardens, even better. It's uh, certainly cooler outside in the gardens right now than it is in my office, but uh, it was a beautiful day in the garden. So I'm going to get started on the um, presentation right away. Um, because I can talk for a really long time about native plants. So um, I'm going to try to pack as much as we can into this uh, into this one hour. And as Yuna said, we'll uh, have an opportunity at the end to answer uh, any questions that you may have. And I'm always available through email as well. You can go to the Botanical Gardens website and um, I may not get back to you promptly in gardening season, but I will get back to you eventually. Um, winter is a great time to ask me gardening questions. <laughs> so we're going to get started. Going to share my screen with you all here, bring my presentation up. Okay, can you see that beautiful pink flower? We can indeed. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, first of all, um, just want to say that I am a transplant here. I um, am from the boreal forest actually, and I am now here at the Acadian Forest region at Acadia University. I've been here in this, uh, this soil since uh, the year 2000, as Una said, helped to, um, to plant the garden and have been taking care of it ever since. And I also want to acknowledge that the Botanical Gardens is um, located in Megamagi, which is the homeland of the Mi'kmaq. And uh, we are just so grateful that they are uh, sharing their homeland with us and uh, sharing their beautiful forest region with us. Thank you for their generosity. So depending on when you graduated from Acadia, this may look familiar to you or it may not, or it may have been a noisy construction site at the time when, um, when you were here. If that was the case, I apologize, but it was long worth the wait. We were under construction for quite a while. Um, and this beautiful building is now the Casey Irving Environmental Science Center and also the Harriet Irving Botanical Gardens. And it all sort of started from the need for the biology department to, to have a new greenhouse. And um, Mr. Irving asked Acadia what, what was needed and they said a new greenhouse. So as you can see from this photo, we have a fabulous new greenhouse. We have a wonderful environmental research center and we also have a beautiful six acre garden. So I'm gonna start off tonight just with a really brief introduction those of you that haven't visited us or those of you that really haven't had a behind the scenes tour, if you don't know um, too much about us, show you a little bit of what we do both at the Irving Center and at the Botanical Gardens. 
So really, we are a environmental science center that really focuses on hands-on learning. These are three undergrad students that were um, through, uh, hired in the summer to work in the greenhouse, uh, working for their professors. One of the wonderful things about Acadia, as you know, um, is that you really can get very involved with hands-on learning. You get to know your professors, and this absolutely happens here in the greenhouse. Um, two of these are actually Arthur Irving Scholars. Um, we have a wonderful scholarship program at Acadia, and uh, two of these students have gone through that program. And it's so wonderful to have them working in um, various types of research. Um, and, uh, you know, we have a, a really wide range of plant research, ecology research, phenology research, um, environmental chemistry research. So that brings us um, downstairs to the labs. And the labs are, uh, sorry, my, there we go. <laughs> the, uh, the research labs are uh, uh, environmental chemistry Primarily, we look at things such as arsenic in the uh, in fingernails and hair, arsenic in humans, in mercury, in water, and in snow. Um, Dr. Nelson O'Driscoll, um, John Marimbo, uh, Jenny Rand, they all look at uh, different environmental contaminants, um, everything um, relating to the Acadian forest region, but not necessarily about plants. So we have a really wide scope. We also have a seed and tissue bank. Um, this is Dr. Robin Brown, our propagation specialist and a student uh, who is actually now a teacher. She's gone through Acadia um, and is now teaching science. Um, we have a, so the seed bank and the tissue bank is really, um, for us, it's really special because it is um, somewhere that we can preserve native species for future conservation and research work. So this is a, a wonderful thing that, that really is just getting off the ground and uh, it's very exciting and we're really looking forward to grow our seed and tissue bank even more. We also have the E.C. Smith Herbarium, which contains over 200,000 um, individual specimens, all of dried plants. So these are uh, vascular plants, these are lichens, they're mosses, they're fungi. Um, and one really neat thing that Acadia students have done for us actually working in the summers is digitize this collection. So we have these 200,000 dry plant specimens all scanned in and available online through our website and available to researchers. So researchers that are looking at, at climate change, how plants are changing, the phenology of plants can go back to historical uh, plant records. So this one here was, uh, looks like it's 1954, um, was collected in um, Yarmouth County. Um, and some of them are much, much older. We have uh, specimens going back right to the 1800s. So this is a wonderful part of, of the Irving Center. We are also a, a meeting place. We're a meeting place for, um, for students, for faculty. Uh, we've really become the Casey Irving Center. This is the orange array. We've become sort of the, uh, the living room for students of Acadia University. These uh, young women are sitting in front of our beautiful Rumford fireplace and uh, there's students um, in the back studying. We had this open um, all through COVID as well, which was wonderful. Um, they weren't getting quite that close this year, but um, we still did allow students to study in there. And then my favorite part, the part that we'll get a little more in depth into is the, uh, the six acre native plant botanical garden. So really what we are is a, is a living gene bank of the native flora of, of this forest region of the Acadian forest in a built environment. Um, and we brought in over 17,000 individual plant specimens to this botanical garden. We also brought in these beautiful granite rocks. We brought in um, large uh, stumps, um, large rotting wood. People thought we were a little crazy when we were trucking in all of this, this material. But what we really have done is recreated um, a mini forest. We're recreating ecosystems. So we brought in so much more than plants, everything that makes up a forest and an ecosystem is, is what we brought in. So we are certainly not your average botanical garden. Um, this is a Acadia group uh, doing pond dipping in our marsh. We have a wonderful marsh. Um, we are a teaching garden. We are a research garden. We are a garden that really gives back to the environment. Um, we are a garden that also helps, like many of you tonight, home gardeners to learn about uh, how to give back to the forest and how to connect with nature and how to really do our part to uh, to make a difference on our planet. So as I mentioned just briefly, we are a garden that is all um, native to the Acadian forest region and it is a garden that is divided into nine different native habitats. So we have a bog and a sand barren, a deciduous woodland, a coniferous woodland, uh, coastal headlands, a marsh, 
um, all of these really beautiful and unique habitats in a very small six acre garden that was very intentionally planted. Um, so it provides a wonderful opportunity for Acadia students to uh, have an outdoor classroom to get hands-on learning with their you know, biology professors, community development professors, um, music students. We've all had lots of uh, recitals and concerts and things in the garden as well. Uh, so it's really a, a wonderful outdoor classroom for Acadia. And also in other times, not in times of COVID, but in, in other times, uh, we're open to the community and we're a very well-loved resource by all community members and by tourists as well. It's a, it's a very busy and, and well-loved spot. So the Acadian Forest Region, uh, what is the Acadian Forest Region? We, um, we know that, I've said that the plants are native to this region, so let's just talk about it for a minute. Um, the traditional name is the Wabanakadi Forest. Uh, Wabanakadi means the, um, the land of the dawn, so where the sun first hits. That's where we are here. And the sun first hits in, in sort of all of this range in the orange there. So it's a forest region that uh, goes, the maritime provinces here, um, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, and then down a little bit into Quebec, into the Gas Bay, and then down to our, our southern partners in uh, Vermont and New Hampshire, a little bit into New York. So that is when we talk about um, a native plant to the Acadian forest region, they're the plants that existed here first. So, a lot of you may not have ever heard of the Acadian forest. Um, I wish we had time to hear all of your stories now, but um, some of you may have, many of you haven't. A lot of you have probably heard where my forest region, where I come from, which is the boreal forest. That's because the boreal forest is a much, much larger range. Now the Acadian forest is a transition zone between the boreal forest to the north and the deciduous forest to the south. So we're this really unique meeting ground of these two, uh, the, south, the southern and the northern forests. So that is the Wabanakadi forest. So this is the boreal forest, as you can see, just the scope of it. And that's why it's primarily written into uh, Canadian curriculum, school curriculum is the boreal forest because it has this such wide range, it's the world's largest biome apart from the oceans. So to give you some perspective, this is the Acadian forest. It's just this tiny, tiny, little unique forest. And it's a very special forest. It is among the 20 richest ecoregions on the continent. But sadly, it is one of six forest regions in North America that is actually considered endangered by the World Wildlife Fund. So this entire forest region is an endangered entity. The Acadian forest only exists in this part of the world. So this really unique transition, this meeting ground only exists here. And we're so lucky at Acadia University to have this beautiful botanical garden and this environmental science center that really focuses on the study of this very unique and very at-risk forest region. So what we're going to talk about tonight is how we can work together to really try to ensure its survival and see what we can do as home gardeners to give back to the forest and to, to help this forest and this unique region. Now, when we talk about the forest, it's also non-forested habitat. You know, we know that we're a very coastal um, area here. So a forest, the Acadian forest region includes these coastal headlands and, and areas like that as well. It also includes our gardens, right? It includes all of the land that is in the, the orange or in the, the small green there that uh, is on your screen. So how do we do that? You know, we, we have... Traditionally, humans um, lately have been, have been pretty hard on our forest regions and we've been hard on plants. Um, how do we help them? How do we enter into a reciprocal relationship with plants? Well, this group of Acadia students uh, was doing a, an awfully good job of that. We had a, a group um, come in. They, this is actually a forest ecology course that is taught by um, a guest professor uh, Dr. Gary Snyder, who's in that photo, and he's from McPhail Woods. McPhail Woods is a, a wonderful organization that works on the Acadian Forest Region in PEI. They're one of our partners in PEI. So he comes every year to the garden and to our woodlands to, uh, to teach Acadia students about forest ecology. And then this was the class. They had a wonderful week. Um, it was a hands-on learning class. Um, you know, they were all outside. You can see they've got dirty hands and shovels and plants in their hands. They love this class. And um, what we did here was, and what we do every year, is we go out to the woods. We um, tear out a lot of invasive species that are disturbing our woodlands, and we replant native species. So that is a way that, as humans, we can really enter, start to enter into a reciprocal relationship with our plants and start to, to really heal um, the forest. 
So another way that, that we can do this is really being choosy about what plants we grow in our home gardens. We can grow native. And just to be clear, a native plant is a, a plant here at Acadia, one that existed um, in the Wabanakadi forest prior to European settlement. So we see a lot of uh, naturalized plants like lupins, uh, Queen Anne's lace, dandelion. Um, those are plants that, uh, that did not exist here prior to European settlement. So would like to talk to whoever introduced the dandelion here, as a lot of gardeners probably would. But um, these are plants that have escaped cultivation. They were brought accidentally or on purpose. And uh, they've really changed our forest region. So what we do at the botanical garden is we really encourage people to, to grow native plants. And that's what we're going to talk about here. This is a very special native plant. This is um, our showy lady slipper. It's one of our uh, beautiful native orchids. Just stunning. This grows near um, uh, Smiley's Park. It's a beautiful one. So some of the ecological benefits of gardening native. Why do we do this? Well, we do this for these beautiful little things like the, uh, the ladybird here on this little blade. I think it's on, a, on an aster. Um, we do it because gardening with native plants provides habitat for a wide variety of wildlife. It increases biodiversity overall and biodiversity on the planet. Um, it, growing native provides a home for, for many native plants that are increasingly becoming rare in the wild. Um, native plants really don't need the same chemical inputs that some of our introduced plants need. So it really eliminates the need for chemical inputs such as pesticides and herbicides and fertilizers. And that's because uh, with native plants, all of the right uh, natural checks and balances are in place. So these plants have evolved over thousands and thousands of years with the insects that are in this area. So they, um, insects sort of have learned to take what they need from our native plants, not to decimate them. When you hear of plants being decimated by insects, it's almost always an invasive species, an invasive insect that has come in or vice versa, uh, an invasive or introduced plant that is, is being decimated. So, you know, we know that um, uh, Japanese longhorn beetle is a great example of that. That was one that escaped, I think, from pallets in, uh, in shipping. Um, there are so many um, invasives that are coming in and, and disturbing our forest region. But when you plant native, they we have the right checks and balances in place. You know, you don't have those, um, those uh, dangerous sort of introductions coming in. Also, and now this is changing a little bit, but the use of native plants really does conserve water because our native plants are more adapted to seasonal droughts. Finding in the last five years that that's changing a little bit with climate change, especially here in Wolfville, we're getting very, very hot, hot, dry, dry summers. So I may have to uh, rethink that, but uh, native plants generally are much more um, tolerant to drought than non-native. So how do we do this? What is restoration garden, gardening and, and how can home gardeners do it? Well, we have a little help from our friends. We have help from our friends such as this, uh, this beautiful little bird. And um, they help us spread the seeds that we plant all through the forest. And now I don't want to get into any gory details, but you can imagine what happens to a, uh, to a bird that eats a seed and it flies around and it does its business in the forest. That's how a lot of our, our seeds spread, right? So we want to make sure that those birds and, and our bears and all of our, our friends in nature are eating the right seeds and planting the right seeds to further help with biodiversity and to further help restore the Acadian forest. So we do that by introducing um, sort of choice plants, seeding plants, and then we let Mother Nature take care of this. You know, we let those plants spread and propagate through um, the flora and the fauna on their own to increase biodiversity even further. And that's why it's so important as home gardeners to really think about what you're planting in your garden. You know, the Rosa multiflora might be a beautiful flower. It's not a great one, but um, it is a very invasive rose. Um, I think it's cedar waxwings. Lots of little birds love eating the hips of those. Um, but then we end up having, you know, it's quite an invasive shrub and end up really disturbing all um, plants in the, uh, the natural forest ecosystem as well. Even though we didn't plant that rose multiflora in our, in our forest, we planted it in our garden, Mother Nature figures out a way to get it in there. So that's why it's so important to, uh, to, to do this style of restoration gardening where we're choosing the right seeds. 
So um, I really want everyone to think of your garden as an extension of the Acadian forest, of the Wabanakati forest region. And um, each seed that you plant is a seed towards restoration and a seed towards improvement of biodiversity as a whole. So some things that we can do as home gardeners. Um, this is one that, uh, so I, when I went to horticulture college, we did an awful lot of leaf raking. And I think we've all done that in our lives. A lot of our, our parents told us to go out and, and rake leaves in the backyard. And, and maybe we do that to our kids or our grandkids. But um, really starting to change that. And, and horticulture is changing. And we're starting to say, let's leave the leaves. You know, they provide wonderful habitat for all the little uh, salamanders and the sow bugs and all the decomposers in the forest. They bring nutrients back to our forest floor and to our gardens. Um, so can we leave the leaves? You know, are there areas that we can rake them off and that maybe need to be raked off? Otherwise, they're going to choke out other plants. They're going to choke out plants like grass, um, but they may choke out some of our, our really young choice plants as well, especially if they're leaves of invasive species like the Norway maple. Sometimes they'll have a really thick mat of leaves. So can we be a little more choosy about the leaves and can we leave more of the leaves? We absolutely can. This is a beautiful evergreen fern, uh, Christmas fern that's uh, coming through and that, that stays all year round. It's a beautiful one. So less is not more. <laughs> um, there is this trend and I don't know how long ago it started, but it's been around a really long time in horticulture and in gardening that we have one plant and then a sea of mulch or a sea of compost or just soil, bare soil all around this one choice plant. Well, mother nature doesn't really like that. <laughs> mother nature wants to fill in, right? So if you can sort of change that, that perception and fill in with the seeds that you want to fill in in your garden or in your forest, we're going to be much better off because you all know as, as gardeners that if you don't fill the space, weed seeds are going to fill that space, right? You're going to get dandelions and horsetail and uh, coltsfoot and, and all those plants are going to come in if there's bare soil. Um, and maybe some gardeners love doing that. They love constantly weeding their garden. But I love the, the style of gardening where I can sit back in my garden and, and sip some tea and, and relax and enjoy and watch the pollinators and watch the hummingbirds come and uh, know that I have created this garden that is self-sustaining, that it's taking care of itself. So this is a uh, red lobelia and blue lobelia, the cardinal flower, and then um, a swan or a giant sunflower in the back. And we have this gigantius. So can we leave the treasures? You know, we want to clean our gardens. We want to clean up all this, all this stuff, all this, uh, you know, the, the leftover things. But uh, if we leave these treasures that we find, look what can happen. We can have beautiful eggs and then beautiful birds. I think these are red-eyed vireos. Um, you know, so really think about when you're cleaning up your garden and, and what can you leave and whose habitat are you destroying when you uh, pull things out of your garden. Really want to encourage everyone to garden for all seasons, especially if you're living in uh, in a climate like we have here at Acadia, where so much the gardening season is relatively short. You know, we have maybe a, a four to six month gardening season. We're still outside and we're still enjoying our um, our backyards, hopefully all year round. Um, so think about choosing guard plants for all seasons. This is a lovely plant called sweet fern, Comptonia, um, and it's a it's a beautiful shrub that has it's very aromatic. It's a member of the bay family, so it sort of smells like a bay, and uh, it looks beautiful in the fall. I just, I love it. This is a great one as well. This is um, bayberry, um, and it has beautiful, this is taken in, in the deep of winter. It has these beautiful waxy berries. So I want you to think about shrubs and, and plants and um, evergreens that you can plant all year round. I hate seeing poor evergreens wrapped in, in burlap, ba burlap bags. I think it would just be so embarrassing to be a, to be a shrub that was covered for the whole winter like that. <laughs> Rose hips, a beautiful fall interest and really important for uh, for wildlife to eat as well. Just make sure that you have to pick the, the right rose hips that, um, that are supporting wildlife. This is our walled garden at the Harry Durgan Botanical Gardens in winter and the structure of the garden is just so stunning during the winter. I, um, I love it in all seasons. Sometimes as a gardener, I think winter is my favorite season in the garden because there's nothing that needs to be done. I can just relax and enjoy and uh, see the beauty of it. So really think about planting for all seasons. 
This again is that same same garden. This is a wild garden at a botanical garden in the in the early spring. And this is a great home uh, landscape plant, shadbush or service berry. Some people call them Indian pear. Uh, they have a million different common names depending on where you're from. Um, but it's amelanchier. There's a there's a number of the amelanchier uh, trees and shrubs when they're all beautiful um, early spring flowers that come out before the leaves come out and they have this beautiful bronzy leaf. Um, and then they have a great berry in the fall, which is very delicious, great for pies and jams and, and things like that. So that, you know, this is one of my favorite native plants because it, it gives and gives and gives. Beautiful in the spring. It's a lovely shade, um, shade bearing or shade giving shrub uh, in the summer, in the heat of the summer. And then in the fall, it has delicious berries and it has nice structure in the winter as well. So it's a good one. This is one I mentioned before, uh, Morella Pennsylvanica Bayberry. Uh, I love this, this shrub because um, it has these beautiful berries. It has a nice aromatic, uh, again, it's like a, a bay smelling uh, leaf, similar to the sweet fern. Um, great thing about this one for Nova Scotia is that it is salt tolerant. So it grows in coastal areas. You'll see it on the backs of beaches and in coastal headlands. And um, why that's great for a home gardener is because you can put it beside a road or be beside a sidewalk. Um, that gets salt spray or beside the ocean if you live beside uh, beside the ocean. So very salt tolerant and has great winter interest. If you have the patience, you can boil those little berries and uh, make candles, scented candles with it, but you need a lot of berries. <laughs> so this is the, um, the wild garden again. This is the wild garden in fall. So you've just seen it in three different seasons and it's just stunning in the fall. We have um, the red in the center of that hedge are high bush blueberries. And then the, the short green hedge in front is um, one of our native hollies. It's inkberry, Ilex glabra. And then the bayberry that we just looked at is the, the shrub that's at the back, just running along um, the hedge there in front of the wall. And then on the wall, it's uh, Virginia creeper, which is another lovely uh, fall plant. It's a, it's a beautiful, it, it's kind of the, um, the Boston ivy of the Acadian forest region. So we say that we have a an Ivy League school here with uh, the Boston Ivy. Boston Ivy is on the Urban Center as well, much to the uh, bricklayers' uh, fear, I'm sure. But, uh, so again, this is a great example of planting for all seasons. So provide pollen. Providing pollen is a really important um, thing to do for restoration gardening, for native plant gardening to, to help um, support pollinators, to help make a difference. Uh, these are asters. Now, there are so many different asters and a lot of them have just been actually reclassified um, in the taxonomy world and they're not all called asters anymore, but they're wonderful plants that are late bloomers and the uh, pollinators just love them because they'll bloom even sometimes into the end of September, or beginning of October, um, really, really important to, uh, to provide pollen all year round. Goldenrods. Goldenrods are amazing. They bloom at the same time as the asters and they get a really bad wrap. And that's a shame because there are so many of them that are just beautiful. There's um, there's a seaside one that is really fleshy and beautiful. Um, they have, a you know, there's not much else blooming at that time for us to look at or for the pollinators. So they're just beautiful for a home garden and, and they tend to get really weeded out. And they have a bad reputation because a lot of people say that they uh, get seasonal allergies from these. But it'd be really hard. You would have to be pretty much that bee and you have to be allergic to it to actually be allergic to um, the goldenrod. It is not wind pollinated, um, but this little guy, the, um, the ragweed is, and it blooms at the same time as the goldenrod. So a lot of people confuse the two and they blame this big, beautiful showy yellow plant because they see it blooming. You don't see this blossom really at all here because it's just a tiny little really green chartreuse colored one. Um, but this is the one that is wind pollinated and makes everyone sneeze. Um, but they blame this poor goldenrod. So, um, you know, it's ragweed that makes you sneeze. It's probably not the goldenrod. Not many people are allergic to goldenrod and not many people stick their faces right in it to how to get that pollen. <laughs> so plant goldenrods, they're, they're wonderful. Great thing to do, give butterflies a home. You know, we, I'm sure that most of us know the, the plight of the monarch butterflies, the, the endangered butterflies now, just from habitat loss and uh, insecticides and, and from so many different factors. Um, there are um, ways that we can really help provide uh, spaces, gardens for butterflies. So plant native flowering plants um, that bloom at all different times, varying times, because the different life cycles of the, the caterpillar and the chrysalis, the, the butterfly, they all have different needs. 
So um, plant flowers in your garden bloom all the time. Adult butterflies tend to be more attracted to the vibrant colors, the red and the orange, the purple, pink and yellow. Um, and plant in large color blocks. You can imagine if you're just a tiny little butterfly and you're flying over the Harriet Irving Botanical Gardens and we'll fill, um, you're not going to necessarily see one milkweed plant, but you're going to see a huge color block of milkweed, right? So think of that if you're planting um, a butterfly garden specifically, plant in large, bright color blocks. Plant in full sun, don't use insecticides. You can create some fun little uh, drinking spots or rest areas in the sun for the butterflies as well. All great ways to support butterflies. So the story of the milkweed and the monarchs, um, the story of the monarchs is quite sad, but it's quite remarkable. You know, these monarchs fly from New Mexico to, to Nova Scotia and back, and it takes several generations for them to get there. They need all the way along that long journey, they need um, a host, they need a larval host. Um, and the only larval hosts uh, for the monarchs are the milkweed species. There's a wide range of milkweed plants that are native all across um, North America, and we need these um, species to be planted in their whole roots, their whole journey. Um, so there's some really beautiful ones that we can plant. This is uh, called swamp milkweed, so it likes wet, it likes to have its wet feet wet. It gets very tall. It's a beautiful, tall, maybe two and a half, three feet tall milkweed plant. Um, and this one sadly is rare in Nova Scotia and it's actually extirpated. It doesn't exist anymore in some of its range. It's an endangered species in other range. Um, because it's had a kind of a hard wrap again, it's, um, um, there, there's a common milkweed that is a, a close relative. It looks very, very similar. The pink flowers are almost identical, but the leaves are quite different um, of common milkweed. And that one has been eradicated very aggressively by um, departments of agriculture, also by departments of transportation um, as a noxious weed. Now, a lot of states and provinces are in the process of getting this delisted. It's really not a noxious weed. How it got listed is because it's a, it's a hard weed on agricultural equipment. So if you've ever broken a milkweed plant, you get that um, sappy, sappy um, liquid that gums up agricultural machines. So that's why it became a noxious weed. They say it's also poisonous to cattle, but I think cattle are smart enough, cows are smart enough not to eat that much milkweed to kill them. Um, so we're really, and so because that one um, was listed as a noxious weed, it was sprayed um, very, very heavily um, with glyphosate to, to kill it. Um, all of these other milkweeds that are very, very similar have also been sprayed and now they're becoming extirpated um, and extinct. So plant milkweeds. This is another great milkweed, butterfly milkweed or Asclepius tuberosa. This is not native to Nova Scotia, but it's, it's um, our more southern range of the Acadian forest. So it's a great one to plant in, in home gardens here too. Those borders are starting to change a little bit with climate change of what lives down south and what lives more up north. So fine one to plant here as well. Another thing we can do is really rethink ground covers, you know, avoid monoculture. Do we really need that monoculture of grass outside of our houses? Um, could we have something that does all the things that we just talked about, you know, providing pollen, supporting butterflies, um, things that, that plants that could also help us, food gardens, you know, it's really only since the um, North American Industrial Re Revolution here in, in North America that um, we started having grass outside our houses. Before that, um, we had kitchen gardens, we had medicine gardens, we had um, places where our, our livestock roamed and uh, things have really changed. And that's, the grass has had a huge, huge effect. You know, that's a, a very detrimental um, industry to, um, to the environment. Uh, so can we rethink, you know, do we need as much grass? Can we leave some of it in meadow? Can we mow pathways? This is a great photo of the White House with, uh, with sheep in the front lawn. <laughs> can we do that at Acadia? I don't know. I keep asking for goats, but uh, our director won't let me. <laughs> so some of the great ground covers that we can choose. Uh, Bunchberry, Cornus canadensis. This is a, a lovely one in the spring. It's a beautiful color, nice flower, and then has a very vibrant red berry in the fall. It's a nice ground cover. This is another great ground cover, uh, wintergreen. Now this is actually the plant where the wintergreen gum and that, that wonderful wintergreen taste originated. It's probably mostly synthesized now from these same compounds, but uh, it's, it's where the wintergreen comes from. This is a great one. Um, it's got an edible berry, it's evergreen, this one. So it's a great ground cover. And I really recommend, you know, as I said, avoid monoculture. So don't just plant wintergreen, plant bunchberry and wintergreen because then if bunchberry fails one year you're going to have um, a ground cover still and um, you know you're providing pollen at different times you're um, 
actually, it looks like there's another plant growing in here too. This is also right in the center there. Um, if you look carefully, there's a false lily of the valley. And, you know, that's how Mother Nature does it. You know, you never see a monoculture naturally. You see um, a wide variety of plants all packed in. So I really encourage that if you want to tear up your grass, don't just plant one thing in its place, plant many things in its place. So can we think beyond blossoms? You know, our botanical garden, you'll never see a tulip in it. Um, it is, it's so much more than the flowers. Sometimes people will visit us and say, where are all the pretty flowers? And they say, well, there were a bunch last week, but there aren't any this week. But look at the garden, you know, there's so much more than just flowers. Um, really try to think beyond that when you're, when you're gardening. Uh, ferns are a great way to think beyond blossoms. We have over 40 of them here in, in native to Nova Scotia. This is beach fern. It's a really stunning one. We have some evergreen ferns that last all year. Um, there's a, a huge variety of them. This is a great shrub, sumac. Um, it turns a, a nice vibrant color in the fall. It has beautiful edible berries and um, they're great for making lemonade. It'd be great on a day like today. On a hot day, you can uh, dry the seeds of the berries and um, you end up with this beautiful, actually it's a nice spice as well, kind of a lemony flavor. So you can put it on potatoes or things like that or, or make a delicious lemonade. Can we maybe plant, you know, go back to how we used to do it, where plant a medicinal garden outside of our house. If, if you're um, able to, uh, to process medicinal plants, it's a great thing to do. Um, it's a fun thing to experiment, be a great COVID experiment to, uh, to plant some plants and, you know, do it with your family or yourself or with your kids or your grandkids. Uh, try to harvest some of the root and, and process them. There's so much information in books and on the internet on um, medicinals, or you really do have to be careful. You have to know your plant ID consult, consult, and, and do your research because lots of plants are poisonous if handled wrong, but um, it's a great way um, to introduce native plants to your garden and to have a, a fun experiment as well. This is an important one um, in medicine. There's been a lot of scientific research on rhodiola um, and uh, it's still in many clinical trials. It's available in, in many um, um, medicinal treatments. Um, rhodiola, rosea, or rose root um, it's uh, one that would be good for COVID right now. It apparently helps combat stress and fatigue. Some of us are feeling stressed these days. So um, it would be a great one to plant in, in gardens. And if, if, you know, the other thing, if none of that has convinced you why you should start gardening and, and start gardening native, let's just talk about really what this does, what getting your hands dirty and into the soil does. You know, it, it makes us feel good and it helps the planet if we're uh, doing it the right way. Um, there has actually been some research. Um, the uh, David Suzuki Foundation did some research and they've been, been and actually a um, research study at the Bristol University did some very specific research looking at the bacteria in soil. And they discovered that there is a, um, a microbacterium that actually um, stimulates the production of serotonin in humans. So you know that you feel really good when you spent the day in your garden and your hands are dirty. Well, there's some science behind that and we're just starting to do more research and, and learn about that. So, so gardening certainly makes us happy. This is a crazy study that has just come out as well. Um, research is starting to show that, um, I mean, it makes absolute sense that harvesting makes us happy. Um, you know, eating and picking our own food um, really actually a leftover from the hunter-gatherer lifestyles triggers a little dopamine release in our brain when we harvest. It's like, it's that same, um, you know, the same thing that I think probably Facebook and all of those things um, have, uh, have, have taken advantage of by like, ding, we get that, we get that little dopamine hit when, uh, you know, when someone likes something or when we find something, when we gather this wonderful fruit. So how cool is that? Um, you know, all you need to do is go harvest some blueberries and, uh, and you'll be a happier person. <laughs> so gifting plants, that also makes us happy. I mean, it's amazing. We gift plants when uh, at a funeral, at a wedding, uh, when a baby's born. You know, plants just make us feel good. They make us happy. This is an Acadia um, mental health initiative that we have uh, twice a year in the potting shed here which um, during really stressful times, we get a huge group of students who often have 150 students lined up uh, to plant a succulent and to take it home. They plant it in these sweet little antique cups and um, it's just a, a great thing. Plants make us feel good. Not only that, plants give us so many gifts. So, um, you know, if you look around your, the room that you're in right now, there's so many gifts that plants have given us in your room in all of our houses. Um, they give us food. 
They give us clothing and fibers and, and you know, flax and cotton. They give us dyes, the blue dye from, from indigo. Um, they give us shelter. They, a lot of us live in wooden houses. They, they provide shelter. Uh, they give us paper, which, you know, passes on stories and gives us education. Um, some people still use it. It's kind of old school, but <laughs> we use a lot of computers these days. They give us some of my favorite drinks, uh, you know, coffee, tea, wine. Uh, they help out with beer, uh, chocolate. Um, they give us medicines. And um, wait a second, the even greater gift that plants give us is air. They breathe out what we breathe in. So we would not be able to breathe. We would not be able to live on this planet without plants. Basically, our little blue, green, and planet would not be our little blue, green, and planet. And we would not, it would not be, have, we wouldn't be able to live on it um, if we didn't have plants. So why do we have to enter into a reciprocal relationship with plants? If we want to live on this planet, that's what we need to start doing. Pretty fundamental, pretty easy one, right? It's a no brainer. So everyone needs to start, uh, you know, really gardening a little more conscientiously and helping to preserve and protect our planet. And that's what this is all about. You know, it's gardening for people and the planet. And um, I love these moments in the garden and it's it, what, what makes my job so special. One of the many things that makes my job so special is just seeing the wildlife that has returned to this relatively urban area in Wolfville, um, seeing this swallowtail butterfly, just captured it with my cell phone when I was gardening in the blueberries here in the wild garden. And, and that's what it's all about. You know, it's gardening for not just us, um, it's gardening for the planet as well. So important. So how do I do this? Um, how do I find native plants? It's one of the most common questions that I get, and it's getting a lot better in the last 20 years. A lot more nurseries are carrying native plants. Um, this is me probably 18 years ago, um, digging, wild digging some plants for our bog. Now this was an area that was going to be peat mined. It was going to be disturbed. So we went in first. We try not to do that a whole lot because we want to leave plants in the wild. We don't want to become just a plant museum. We want to support them in their natural habitat and in their wild. But um, we do do that for environmental assessment companies every once in a while. The key to that when we do that is we then take the plants into tissue culture, we grow plants on, we wait till the construction has settled, and then we ensure that plants get planted back out into that same habitat. So we have the ability to do that. Um, but where do you find native plants? Um, Baldwin's Nursery, if you're in our area, is a great one. It's in Falmouth, Nova Scotia. But I really encourage wherever you are in the world to uh, help create that demand for native plants, to go out there, ask your nursery, hey, do you carry native plants to this region? I, I want to buy them. You know, that's how, um, that's how the nursery industry works. They're going to bring you what, what the uh, customer wants. So ask, ask for native plants by all means. If you live in this area or you're, you're due for a, a visit back when travel restrictions are more open again to, uh, to Acadia, come to our plant sale in May. We have uh, about a thousand people that visit us every, um, every May to purchase native plants that we have a large volunteer group that collects seeds from the garden. We then propagate the plants in our greenhouse and outside, and then we sell native plants. So that's been running for, for I guess, 20 years now. So a lot of, we've released a lot of native plants into the wild. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. This is our, some of our volunteers here that, that do that work. And we really believe as a group, and I really believe personally that um, you know, we really can together we can make a difference. There's lots of scary environmental stories right now, but together we really can help to restore the Wabanakati forest, this forest region that is so rare and so precious and so small. And you can, no matter where you are in the world, you have native plants to your area and you can help restore the forest anywhere that you are in the world and support the planet as a whole. It just takes one person, one native plant at a time. You know, there's um, the, the worst action is, is no action. So, so do try to, uh, to make a difference. So I apologize if I went too fast because I was trying to get through all that and I, I tried to cut some this morning, but I just couldn't. There's so much good information I wanted to share with you all. Um, and I want to really thank you from all of the entities in the gardens. This is a, a little American uh, a toad and I love him dearly. I saw him this one day on the, the quiet lawn and um, you know this is why I do my job and uh, I'll just leave you with a really brief story of of the spring peepers. This is not a peeper. They're, they're too small to catch and too small to see but um, you know it took about five years for the botanical gardens to um, for, the, for the creatures to find us um, and it took five years for the spring peepers to find us. If you've ever been at Wolfville, in Wolfville in the spring or in Nova Scotia in the spring, you'll hear the amazing call 
of these little tiny tree frogs. Now they need trees and they need a marsh, they need water. Uh, we gave them both. We put a marsh in and we surrounded it by trees. Five years later, we have a huge chorus of, of tree frogs. And an elderly gentleman that lived, um, I think he's actually, was he since passed away, but he was a retired professor. He, um, he hated us during construction. He'd always shake our fists at us when we were driving tractors past. After the construction settled five years later, him and his elderly wife sat on the porch of their house on Westwood Avenue behind the garden and they had the chorus, the spring peepers came to their doorstep and they thanked me for that. They said, ah, oh, thank you. We understand what you're doing now. You know, we have created this little oasis, this beautiful oasis in a relatively urban area um, right on the campus of Acadia. What a treasure is that? And that is truly why I do what I do and why I hope that when you can visit again, you will, and I hope that you can, can make a difference to your own uh, ecosystems. So thank you very much. Melanie, thank you so much. You are an absolute wealth of knowledge. Um, clearly very passionate about what you do. Um, lots, lot, I mean, I'm listening and I'm jotting down questions and this is this is a challenge I have when we do these sessions is I want to hog all the airtime and ask all the questions. So <laughs> it's best not to do that. Um, so folks on the line, you can ask your questions in one of two ways. Please feel free to chat or rather write your questions in the chat function. And the chat function can be launched on your screen by clicking the little text bubble. Um, uh, usually at the top right hand part of your screen. If you click that, it will open the chat function on your right hand side. If you are more comfortable asking your question, please feel free to do so. Uh, you can engage your camera and you can engage your microphone. Um, so if you if we do have people doing that and wanting to ask questions, um, if you could raise your virtual hand or if you engage your camera, raise your real hand and, and we'll do our best to get to you. So. Um, We've got some some conversation happening in the chat function right now, Melanie. Most there's a comment saying thank you for all the pictures. Um, you've answered my most urgent question: where to get native plants? And I, Nancy, I agree. Nancy Hanjigan has said that. I agree. You know, point taken that when you go to nurseries and say, can you bring in these native plants? They're gonna it's it's supply and demand. So when you ask that question, so great advice on that one. Um, I for one am taking away the advice uh, to leave the leaves. Thank you very much. I just needed to have some. Somebody tell me that. Woo! I believe in the leaves from now on. Uh, all right, let's see what we have here. We have a, a can't wait to visit the gardens coming in the chat function there. Um, how can we get started in June? So there's, yeah. yeah, so I feel I think some people maybe feel like they, they, the, the horse has left the barn. Um, so we're in June and it's hot. So give us some pointers, please. Yeah, absolutely. So we just did some planting today and it is getting hot and late, but it's not too late. Um, you have, you know, really the month of June is still an okay time if you're willing to put a little bit of water into it, you know, hopefully you have a rain barrel or something that you can collect. I collect rain um, in the early, early season in, in April rains and then I water my garden with it all through the season. Um, well, not always all through, but um, water it now in June. Um, there's still lots of planting that can be done. Um, sometimes, and it's hard for us as gardeners, but sometimes if you're transplanting something right now, cut the plant off. It depends on what the plant is. If it's a herbaceous plant and it's really hot and you're worried about it shocking and flagging, there's still so much growing season that you can actually prune a lot of the herbaceous perennials down and then they will regenerate really nicely. And then all that energy goes to the roots rather than to the shoots. So that's a great way to do it. Um, and you can still plant trees and shrubs and, and that sort of thing too. And then the fall is a great time to plant. It's often a neglected time um, for planting and for nurseries. Um, there's still lots to plant then um, as long as you do it. You know, we plant sometimes right until um, November. It's fine to plant in the fall as well. So, so dream about your garden in the summer, do some research because research is so key and then, um, and then plant in the fall or, or get, get busy in the next two weeks. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Melanie. Um, great talk uh, is a comment here followed by the question that says, if folks are planting native plants that can be harvested, do you recommend only harvesting a certain fraction of the berries or fruit? I do, yeah, um, absolutely. Leave leave some of the um, some of the fruit for the wildlife, and also to regenerate if you're willing to uh, to have it, to give it to the forest, right? Um, and I recommend that too if you're if you're doing any sort of wild harvesting of seeds or, or fruit or anything, always leave some of them. I don't have like a scientific number of what because it depends on depends on the tree or the shrub or the or the plant, but always never harvest everything. That's that's a really important and, and good point. So thank you for that. 
Um, a gold star for the person who asked that question. So, um, and, and it just says be robust show. So thank you for your for your question. Next one is are the native plants at Baldwin's Nova Scotian ecotype? So yeah, so some of them are. Um, Robert Baldwin does quite a lot of um, collecting of, of local stock of, of native seeds and then propagating the plants um, from there and then selling them. And some of them he would bring in from Ontario and from other places. So when we first started the botanical gardens, we wanted to really keep it pure and all local native um, stock that originated in the Acadian forest. And the, the, we just didn't have enough plants that we could do that. So we did sneak some in from, from other areas as well. They're still native to this region, but the origin sometimes are from away. I'm okay with that. It's not ideal, but um, as long as it's not a rare plant, as long as it's a common plant, it's okay. Great. How long does a plant need to be present in the environment before you'd call it native or at least acceptably native? <laughs> Thousands of years <laughs> to answer simply, but you know, it's changing and that, you know, biologists are doing more and more research um, about that. And, and there are some plants that are naturalized that we feel okay about because they're not displacing native plants. Um, so if they're playing nice and they're becoming, you know, a, a nice part of our, our forest ecosystem, then, maybe eventually they'll, it depends on who you talk to. It depends on which scientist you talk to. So it's not a quick thing. You know, it takes thousands of years for plants and insects to evolve together. Um, so it's a slow journey, but you know, there are, there are some good invasive or some good introductions and some less invasive of the, uh, the introductions. So, so uh, uh, you know, nice segue to the next question is, um, are there any online resources you would recommend for lists of native plants best suited for gardens? I'd like to know what to ask for at the nursery. Absolutely, and that's the key, right? You have to do your research first. So um, there is a great one uh, it's called canplant.ca. It's part of the, uh, it used to be managed by Evergreen, but it's now taken over. So it's, um, it's literally just can-plant.ca um, and that is a great one. You can actually say, I have a shady garden. This is what I'm looking for and it'll, it'll give you some suggestions. Um, there's another one that is um, the Native Plant Trust, nativeplanttrust.org and that's another great one. Maybe we can uh, share those with you um, as a group. So it's plantfinder.nativeplanttrust.org slash planters. There we go. Someone got it there. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Absolutely. And, and there is a bit of information, Melanie, thank you, that you pulled together um, because we had some folks who registered for the session this evening uh, send their questions previously. So Melanie has pulled together some information with some links that we are going to pop into an email to send to folks who were here this evening. Uh, Nancy Handrigan, I see your hand is up. Hi, I'm not going to type this time. <laughs> Thanks so much again, Melanie. Um, my question actually is not about the plant specifically, and I see somebody else does have one, but I'll just segue to the side here. Um, I'm interested to know two things. One, if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit more about the seed bank, and two, in general, who visits the garden? Like, I'm, I'm particularly interested in whether or not the students have a, an enjoyment of the garden. I know we get visitors from all over the world and all over the country, and there are local folks who help out there, but maybe um, our guests tonight would be interested to know some of those things. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so it's a really diverse group and it depends on the time of the day and, and the time of the year. Um, through the academic year, it is primarily students um, and during the day, it's primarily students in classes. So we have um, large groups that do meet in the gardens um, for study specifically. Um, that was very popular during times of COVID in September when we were a little more open and we had a lot of, we had one whole class that met there every week. Their, their whole class was outside in the gardens, which is community development. So that was great. It's very well used by students during the academic year. In the evenings during the academic year, uh, we have things like outdoor bonfires in the garden. So it's bringing uh, students and residents outside to their backyard, to the garden. And we'll have a lot of groups that will just, you know, there's often students that will practice their violin in the garden, music students, they will um, sit on a bench and, you know, there's students that'll just sit and study um, sunbathe in the garden. So used by students a lot during the academic year. And then we really switch. Um, we switch in the summer to, we have um, um, a native plant flora class. So we have a few intercession classes in the forest ecology class. So that's very active as well. And then we switch to tourists, you know, July and August are our tourists. And certainly we have alumni reunions sometimes and, and large 
uh, conferences and groups. So it's a really diverse area. It's a really, really um, wonderful opportunity for so many different people. Um, and the seed bank is, um, so the seed bank is something that um, we are slowly getting off the ground. It started with some Tupperware containers in someone's desk. I think it was our, our curator's desk and we're really um, putting more into that right now. And it's really exciting. We also have a tissue bank. So um, that is getting cataloged and we're writing protocol on, you know, how many seeds to collect from the wild, what to collect from the wild, what seed we need to collect. And then we're going to, we, we have started planting those plants into the garden and also planting them in our research garden so that we can continue collecting seed from them and eventually get those seeds out to people and use that as a, a shared resource. We're not there yet because we don't have the volumes yet. Right now we've been focusing more on the rare and endangered seed and on housing those, but we're also going to get into the more common seed eventually. Great, thank you. I have to say, I know there are other questions, but when I was a violin major at Acadia, I actually, before the gardens were there, I did play in the garden because I had an apartment that was right on that corner <laughs> of yeah. Westwood and Park. It's gone because the garden's there, but that's kind of funny that you said they practiced their violin in the garden because I kind of did before it was there. That's well, funny. And, and when she said that, Nancy, I was like, did, she, did Melanie know that you played violin? Like, how did you play right into that hand, Melanie? <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. I don't think so. <laughs> well, come back and play your violin there, please, Nancy. <laughs> so the next question in the chat function says, parts of my property are just sand. What can I plant there? Yeah, so there are a lot of native plants that do very, very well in the sand. We actually have a whole sand barrens um, in the garden, and it's just pure sand. So we did a full soil excavation, brought in just sand, and there are so many plants. Um, white pine uh, trees, love it. Um, low bush blueberries do well in, uh, in sand. Um, there's a plant called, um, it's kind of sweet, it's called pussy toes because it looks like little cat feet. Um, Antenaria neglecta um, does very well in sandy soil. Um, red osier dogwood, it's a beautiful shrub, bright, bright red stems. Um, so red osier is a great one. Um, there's a wide variety. And again, if you go to those resources to, um, to can plant and type in sandy soil, I'm pretty sure they have soil types that you can look at there. Or when, when we're open to the public again, come to the gardens if you're local or um, you know, do some research on sand barren habitats. We have, if you're in Nova Scotia, um, the whole Greenwood area is pretty much just straight sand. Maybe that's where you're where you're asking from, or maybe you're asking from from another sandy place. But there are lots of grass doesn't do well. Grass doesn't like it so much um, unless you want to water it every day. But um, there are lots of native ground covers and things that do well in the sand. Thank you. You uh, again, just uh, you know, we we are asking for websites. It's like, can we just have a Melanie Priestnitz website? Can we just click on you every time we have a question? That would be fantastic. Yeah, just come visit me in the garden. I'd way rather that. <laughs> so we we have someone else saying they're so excited to visit the garden. Um, there's another question. Uh, actually, it's two questions from from Kelly. Kelly, the first one you asked, will there be access to the slides and the names of the pictures of plants that Melanie shared with us? So this uh, uh, session has been recorded and will be available on our events landing page. So you can revisit the session, you can pause it, you can write notes, you can and see the entire presentation again. So I think that's the best way to answer that question. And then she says also, since things are warming up due to climate change, should we be trying to foresee what plants are going to be more heat tolerant rather than cold tolerant? Yeah, it's a tricky one um, because the predictions for Nova Scotia are that climate change is just going to make things a little more wacky in Nova Scotia, you know, they're just, uh, they're really changing. They're maybe hotter in the summer, but maybe colder in the winter, you know, more extreme, um, different changing rain patterns. So there's not an easy answer to that, but I, I think the best thing to do is to, um, to really make sure that you are taking care of the roots of your garden, you know, that you're feeding compost to your garden, you're really getting healthy plants, and then they're going to be more resistant to whatever Mother Nature and climate change throws at them. So really focus on, don't just, you know, I always say if you have a garden, don't plant it the first year, spend the whole year on soil, just fixing the soil so that you can have good roots. Um, so yeah, healthy plants are going to be able to be more tolerant of heat and cold. As you say that, it brings back many a day of me standing in a peat moss bog with my dad collecting peat for the garden and <laughs> rubber boots in the in the bog. That's great. 
So we had, a, as I said, we had, we had a list of questions submitted and Melanie took some time to provide some answers to those questions. So we will send that out as part of the um, follow up email as well. So your questions have been heard and they have been answered uh, because we have run out of time here this evening. If you can believe it, we're eight o'clock on the nose. Um, so a quick uh, housekeeping item. The winner of our, our uh, mail out, our Acadia swag mail out is Jill Hayden. So Jill will be getting that out to you uh, in the mail at the address that we have on on our system for you. So congratulations, Jill, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone who joined us on this beautiful evening, wherever you are. I hope it's a beautiful evening, wherever you are, um, and, and sharing your hour with us and with Melanie. And thank you, Melanie. Um, as I say, just a wealth of knowledge, and it's so wonderful for us in this virtual event series to be able to share the knowledge that we have on campus with our alumni community, um, you know, right outside our back door, right across to wherever folks have joined us. So really, really appreciate Appreciate your time this evening, Melanie. Thank you. And for folks on the line, just so that you know, our next virtual event in the virtual event series is on Monday, June 21st, and we will have Dr. Rob Rayside, another all-time favorite from campus for many, many people. And he'll be doing a present presentation called Has Climate Change Driven Human History? Lessons from the Past for a Climate Future. So another good one uh, right on the heels of this one from Melanie. And uh, again, as I say, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Stay well. So we still have some uh, some comments coming in the chat function, Melanie. I hope you can see them. Um, and Sandra, you can uh, click uh, the recording can end anytime. It's done. Um, yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Sandra. So sometimes people will stick around for a minute or two just to see if you're if you are, are here and staying. Um, but let's see. Thanks for such an informative presentation. I'm getting started with outdoor gardening and your advice has been wonderful. That comes from Melanie Coleman and Melanie's actually in our office, in the alumni office. Uh, and the sh admittedly very, very embarrassingly one plant I have in my house came from <laughs> Melanie Coleman. So I'm <laughs> trying to ease my way back in and Melanie's helping me. Uh, Jill says, thank you. Yeah, Melanie, just great responses here. Um, with everyone and it's interesting to see people say I can't wait to visit the garden so I wonder where Kathleen is and, and hope she's close enough that she's able to visit sometime soon I hope so yeah yeah it's worth the visit <laughs> Kathleen is from Halifax she just well, put that in chat perfect so there you go you're not far kathleen and you're you're allowed to visit us now too so there you oh well i guess not i was gonna say you're allowed to travel around the province a little bit more but we're still close to the public i guess um i see a hand in the chat function so i'm gonna see um heather heather has her hand up and if you're okay melanie to take another question that'd be great absolutely heather can you hear us okay we are not hearing you if you are attempting to ask your question. Maybe try it, maybe try it in the chat function, Heather. No. All right. Yeah, well, and the, and the, you know what, Heather, if you can hear me and you do have a question, by all means, you can send it in an email and we'll do our best to get an answer back to you. Uh, another thank you. All right, folks, that's it. Thank you so much, Melanie. We'll, we'll hopefully see you again soon in, in travels around around campus and in the gardens very, very soon. Okay, thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.